All right, hello, and welcome to the Hudson Institute's Dialogues on American Foreign Policy. Uh, my name is Walter Russell Mead, Distinguished Fellow at Hudson Institute, and today I have the honor of speaking with Senator Marco Rubio of Florida. Senator Rubio was first elected to the U.S. Senate in 2010 and serves as a leading voice on immigration, human rights, and national security issues. Senator Rubio serves as the acting chairman of the Select Committee on Intelligence and is chairman of the Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. He's a senior member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, where he serves as chairman of the Subcommittee in the Western Hemisphere, Transnational Crime, Civilian Security, Democracy, Human Rights, and Global Women's Issues. It's a very busy subcommittee. He also serves on the Senate uh, Committee on Appropriations and the Special Committee on Aging. Senator Rubio has been a vocal critic of the Maduro regime in Venezuela, the Islamic Republic of Iran's government, and the Chinese Communist Party. In July, Senator Rubio was part of a group of U.S. citizens banned from China as a result of his criticism of the CCP's human rights abuses against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. In August, he and 10 other Americans were sanctioned by China for the same reason. Senator Rubio has recently sounded the alarm on issues such as Chinese espionage, U.S. election security, and the path forward for recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Rubio, thank you for joining me today. Appreciate oh, thank you. you. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Well, um, you know, as we're looking toward an election and trying to wrap our heads around where the United States may be going, what do you think the major themes of a second Trump administration's foreign policy would be? Well, if I could just set the stage, because I think it's, this is relevant, and that is, you know, if you look at the, and, and you would know better than I would, but those who study American foreign policy, I think there's two themes that run through it uh, throughout our history. The first is this balance between our ideals as a nation and our national interests. Um, they don't always necessarily align. We saw that in the Cold War, and we, we see that even now in parts of the world. And then historically, our nation seems to, especially since probably from Waterloo forward, you've seen a country that has sort of struggled between the exuberance of our, you know, our power, the, which is considerable, and our limits. Even though we are the most powerful nation in human history, there are limits to our power. And so what ends up happening is as we engage in the world, eventually, you know, we find our limits and then there's a blowback against that and it causes uh, the American people to sort of say pull back and, and focus on, on what's going on here at home. And so we're in a period like that right now, you know, where, where if you look at what's happened in the Middle East, um, it's a place where the United States considerable power uh, made a big difference. It also is a place where our limits have, have been shown. Again, where it's not, we're not limited because we're not powerful. We're limited because every nation is limited. It's also a place where our ideals and our national interests are at stake. So I think for any president, and especially for this one, getting that balance right is important. And I say especially for this one because he has challenged a lot of the convention around both pre-existing alliances and so forth. And you know, in hindsight, I think that's been a very positive thing. At a minimum, if you supported the, the world order that existed from World War II to 2016, then it caused you to go back and sort of justify it because it's being challenged. And if you thought it needed to be reformed, then this administration has provided a roadmap for that. So uh, to answer your question, I think the biggest task of a second Trump presidency will be to sort of uh, give structure to those instincts that he brought into the office. Um, what does a 21st century NATO look like? What does a Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific alliance look like uh, with India, Australia, Japan, and the United States? Um, what does, what are our interests in the Western Hemisphere look like? What role do we want to play in Africa, uh, in a place where the Chinese have become increasingly aggressive, both for the votes at international forums and because of natural resources? And in the Middle East, you know, how do you balance not just the geopolitical factors at stake there, but the ethnic, eth ethnic and, um, and, uh, and uh, the religious differences uh, between Shia and Sunni and so forth. That's a lot. And, and it requires us to rethink it. What we cannot do is assume that the world looks like it did in 2001 or in, in 1996. It is a different world. And it requires us to repurpose a lot of what we do around the world to, to confront that. And my last point, and it was a long answer, but that's what senators do, and, uh, and that is um, clearly, in my view, when they write a book about the 21st century, um, the vast majority of that book is going to be about the relationship between the United States and China 
and whether there was an equal, a sustainable equilibrium between the two countries or whether there was a disequilibrium or imbalance that led to conflict, um, which I think would, would define the 21st century negatively. So, so that's a big undertaking, but that I think is the overarching themes, I hope, of, of a second Trump term. And do you have any, I mean, you certainly meet with the president uh, and talk about these issues with him. Do you have a sense of, of what those instincts are telling him about how to bring a structure? Because I think one of the criticisms people sometimes make of him is that um, he has a lot of instincts, but has a, it, it's harder to try to put these in, to build an architecture and to sort of develop a strategy around the instinct, uh, those instincts. What's your view? Well, I don't, again, pretend to speak for the administration. I can tell you my views on what the president's instincts tell him. And that is, you know, as someone who's not a political figure, who has not you know, spent 20 years attending conferences of the Council for Foreign Relations or things of that nature, his just sort of logical common sense question is, these are now, you know, South Korea is a rich country. Uh, Europe is a, is a rich continent with, with, with rich economic powers. Why are we spending so much money providing for their defense? And, and, and I think that's a valid question. And by the way, he's not the first one to ask it. The, the, I think there's a good opportunity to sort of balance. We don't, we don't keep doing things just because we've always done it that way. It's a good opportunity to answer that question. And I do think it's a good opportunity, as previous presidents have done, to ask for our partners to do more um, in their own defense. You should at least be able to expect from your allies that they are capable, especially you know, developed nations, that they are capable of protecting their national territory. Their ability to provide assistance in uh, ex, 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 you know, foreign conflicts outside of their national borders are a different matter, but their ability to protect their own territory is something that is not too much to ask of a developed nation. So I think that's a good starting point where I think he'll think about. I think that the same is true with regards to South Korea to some extent. Now, how much of that is we're in active negotiations with them now? So how much of that is you know, negotiating tactic and how much of that is um, how he really believes is, is something I can't speak to, but, but I do think you'll see a re-examination of both our presence in, in South Korea and our presence in, in parts of Western Europe and, and the NATO alliance. I don't think, I hope he won't, it's not an abandonment of either one, but certainly a modernization of both of those relationships. You know, uh, let's, let's turn to the Western Hemisphere for a little while, because I think uh, that's, that's a part of the world where you have, um, taken a, a lead on some issues. It looks as if the original sort of strategy to try to help the internal opposition in Venezuela um, uh, develop some more space and have free elections there has not been, has not succeeded, at least not yet. Where would you see Venezuela policy going in a, in a second Trump term? Well, and I think that's the way it's been couched that it's, uh, but let me say two things about it. it. It is actually a place where both our national interests and our ideals align. In the case of Venezuela, you have a criminal corrupt regime. It's not a government. It is an organized crime ring that actively participates in the trafficking of drugs destined for the mainland of the United States that has created military intelligence and economic alliance with Iran and invited them onto their national territory in our hemisphere, which has also invited a Russia and military presence in terms of advisors and technicians and things of that nature, who also has a very close technical and espionage relationship with the Chinese. So here you have three uh, global adversaries who have found a foothold in our hemisphere. The second is that the catastrophic situation there has created a humanitarian crisis, which is undermining Colombia, Peru, Brazil, a huge challenge for those countries, particularly in Colombia, which is our closest uh, ally in, in, in the region in, in South America. So there's a national interest there. It's also a place that you know we can't, unless we're gonna send military forces in there to topple them by force, US sanctions were never designed to topple a regime. What they were designed to do is ensure that the concrete doesn't dry on that system that they're trying to create there. And, and thereby giving an opportunity for the Venezuelan people to find a different way forward. Ultimately, the future of Venezuela belongs to Venezuelans. What we can do from our end is support them uh, as best we can, and at the same time, do everything we can diplomatically, geopolitically, um, and, and from an economic standpoint to be supportive of them. But the second thing that we can do is ensure that we don't accept as legitimate and valid uh, a regime that frankly is not in our national interests and also is against our ideals. 
So that, that's always been the view that continues to be the view. And in the case of Venezuela, I would say this, the Maduro regime is, is waiting. They are trying to do two things at the end of this year, as we get to the end of this year. They're hoping Donald Trump doesn't get reelected. And they're hoping that the international community will fall for these fake elections that they are planning on holding in December. And they believe if they can pull those two things off, if Trump loses and they can pull off these fake elections and enough countries recognize them as valid, then they can buy themselves a new era. If it doesn't work, uh, then I think you're going to see some very serious internal uh, tumult over there. And, and what direction that heads is unpredictable. But so, so that, you know, I don't know what the alternative was. The alternative in Venezuela was to say, sure, Maduro's fine, but then the president would be criticized for coddling and authoritarian. So um, it really was a no-win situation politically. It's one of those situations where you don't have the luxury of having a great option. You were trying to choose between two less than ideal options and come up with a one that best reflects our national interests. Seems that Iran has been openly defying uh, U.S. sanctions and, and sending oil and other things to Venezuela. Um, do you see any role for the United States in dealing with that collaboration? Yeah, I mean, there's two things to keep in mind there. The first is they are actually stealing uh, the gold of Venezuela, both out of their national reserves and also illegal mining, and they're getting a great deal. I mean, you are able to sell a dollar worth of gasoline for a dollar fifty or two dollars worth of gold uh, in a country that's hard up for for currency. That's a great deal for the Iranians. Um, the second is anything they can do to defy the United States is something they're going to be for. I think more concerning is if you were to begin to see weapon sales which I think is a possibility if in October here coming up very soon, the conventional weapons ban on, on is lifted against Iran. Now you can see them beginning to share um, weaponry with the Venezuelan military, which is problematic because there are also, in addition to them, there are all sorts of criminal elements that control large swaths of Venezuela, the FARC, the ELN, other criminal uh, groups. And it would be a catastrophic outcome to see those groups wind up in possession of uh, advanced weaponry that they can use to target uh, the Colombians, uh, U.S. Uh, anti-drug efforts, uh, anti-cocaine efforts uh, in that region and so forth. And, and it would also, frankly, lead to Colombia and other countries having to pursue the same weapons in return. And if they can't get them from us, they buy it from the Israelis or somebody else. So I, I do think there's a role to play there. I think in that sense, op many options are on the table, including the physical prevention of those weapon weapons reaching there. Uh, I think that includes intercepting uh, vessels at sea. That, that's a real possibility. The, the U.S. Um, has sanctions and, and has a right to enforce them. And also from an economic standpoint, going after sort of any commercial carrier that, that allows for that to, to happen. Obviously, they can always send things over with Mahan Air, which is their airline, but there are only certain things you can fly. Many other things have to be shipped. But that's a deep concern and an issue to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. um, Cuba has kind of dropped off the... Uh foreign policy radar in some ways. It's not, uh, not a subject you hear a lot discussed. Where do you see administration policy on Cuba going? And do you see any hope for change on, in I, Cuba? I, I do see hope for change in Cuba. So if you, go, you have to go back you know, to the last couple of years of the Obama administration. So Fidel Castro you know, is on his deathbed. Raul Castro and the 80-something-year-olds uh, that were involved in the revolution I mean, they're, they, are, they, don't, they don't believe they're immortal. And so what they viewed themselves as, we need to set in stone. We need to, going back to a phrase I used earlier, we need the concrete to dry on this form of government. And if we could get the U.S. to take us off the terrorism list and begin relations with us diplomatically and some economic opening, it is the first step towards normalizing our system of government that allows us to maintain control of the people by maintaining control of the economy, but our system of government will be acceptable. And that was their plan. And the president blew it up. And he blew it up by basically saying, we can have economic engagement with Cubans. In fact, that's one of the great untold facets of what he did. He basically said, if you're, an in, if you're an individual Cuban who opens a business, you can do trade and commerce with us. And we want to do more. But if you are an entity owned, especially those owned by the Cuban military through a holding company called Gaesa, mm -hmm. then you can't. And he's gone pretty aggressively against that. And it's put them in a very bad spot because they realize they're running out of time for, for the sort of firming up of that system of government. And the people left behind are largely technocrats. They are not individuals who inspire the, the sort of revolutionary zeal that Fidel might have among some in the population. 
added to that is the fact that everyday Cubans no longer buy this idea that this is all the result of the U.S. embargo. They ask common sense questions. Fine, but why isn't Cuba full of Toyotas and Nissans and and uh, and uh, BMWs and Mercedes? Uh, the only you know why why can't I open a small business like my cousin that lives in Miami? And um, and so those questions are happening as well. So I do think that the only way forward is a combination of political and economic opening. And I don't pretend to say to you that Cuba is going to turn into Belgium overnight or Sweden or Switzerland or any of those places. But I do think that the process of more economic and political freedom is, is, is valuable, but only if we can prevent the current system from becoming a permanent feature. And, and that's what these sanctions have done. So my sense is that the Trump administration in a second term will be watching and prepared to act and move on that possibility when it presents itself. Um. Where do you see U.S.-China relations headed in a second Trump term? Well, I, where I, let me start by saying, you know, a lot of times I'm characterized as a Chinese or a China hardliner. I'm not anti-China. I'm actually a huge admirer of their ancient culture and history. And I believe it's inevitable that they're going to be a rich and powerful country. And my hope is that we have a relationship with China that's built on equilibrium and balance where we both understand each other's vital national interest and can be respectful of it. Now, that doesn't mean we're not gonna speak out when people are being put into late forced detention. That doesn't mean we're not gonna speak out when people are mistreated and, and, and religious liberties are violated. But that also doesn't mean that we don't understand that they're a large, almost the largest economy in the world at this point, uh, with a growing military presence, um, most populous nation on the planet. We, we have to deal with them and we need to do so in a balanced way. What has happened over the last 25 years is that there was a consensus in American politics that we should allow China to cheat and to do whatever they wanted and, and in, the, in the commercial realm, because once they got rich, once they became prosperous, it would become more democratic and play by the rules. And that hasn't worked out. And so the president takes office, that realization takes hold. And now it feels like we're doing a lot because we're trying to make up for 15 or 20 years of mistakes. So my hope is that in a second term, that we can begin to reach that equilibrium with them that's sustainable for the long term and leads to both peace and, and prosperity. We'll be competitors. In some cases, we'll be rivals. But we don't want to wind up being enemy you know, combatants in an armed conflict if that can be avoided. And I don't think they want that either. But that may be where we wind up at some point in the future if we do not do the things now to have some balance there. And, uh, and there are things we need to do domestically on that front. We need, to, we need to rebuild American industry. You can't be a great power if you're not an industrial power. We can't allow them to continue to deindustrialize. It's going to require us to invest in, in, in industries and to be engaged in industries that are important to our national security. So I think that a second Trump term would, would continue in that direction. I think that's why the Chinese prefer he not be reelected, because they think, frankly, that uh, former Vice President Biden is a more traditional political figure that will kind of go back to that, that, that previous consensus. Sounds like to me as if Taiwan may be the flashpoint in U.S.-China relations, the one place where our vital interests might clash in some way. Does that, how do you, how do yeah. you think of the Taiwan issue? Well, it's a tricky situation. Um, obviously, the, the, the Chinese position within Taiwan has eroded, as you saw in the recent elections in Taiwan. Clearly, those who uh, oppose um, uh, being linked to the mainland uh, have grown both in prominence and in political strength um, at the same time as the U.S. has become uh, more assertive in, in its relations uh, with Taiwan, sending now two high-ranking officials there in the last month and a half. And you've seen sort of an uptick in Chinese uh, air incursions into the air defense zone sort of as a messaging exercise. I do believe that eventually uh, it is a red line issue for China. And eventually, if necessary, they will move if by force, if necessary, to, to sort of exert what they, their claims on Taiwan. And in many ways, what we've seen them do in Hong Kong is sort of a test for that in, in the sense that. I, that's how I, they ideally want it to be. They would love to have political figures in Taiwan that manipulate the existing system to make that happen. But they're prepared, as they were in Hong Kong, to send in forces if necessary. The only thing that would prevent that from happening is if the cost of doing that is too high. And so my view is the first thing is that we should uh, help Taiwan not to win an all-out conflict against China. That's not possible. But to have the capability to raise the cost of military um, adventurism there to a level that China is not willing to pay. 
and, and, and that navigate that very carefully with an effort not to sort of try to trigger a conflict like that from happening. Um, and, and that's, I think, the best hope um, that, that we have at this point in managing that relationship. But it's a, it's a very difficult one. It's a, it's a, a challenging and tricky one. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I do think we, we have to navigate it very carefully and, and not be overly provocative, but also not be provocative in the reverse by almost inviting a Chinese um, uh, action there at some point here in the next decade. Then uh, for the last 20 years, we, as, as you say, we've had this consensus on China. There's also for the last 20 years, Americans keep trying to reset the relationship with Russia. And uh, I think every president since George W. Bush has, uh, has tried to have a, a, a mind meld with Putin or to reach some kind of an, an agreement. Where do you see U.S.-Russia relations going in a second Trump term? Well, uh, that too is a tricky one. I'm not an expert on Russian history, but I know that it deeply influences. The, it's a, that's a tough concept for us Americans. We're you know, 244 years old. Um, we're still a young country from a relative point of view, um, and we are made up of people who come from all over the world, a, a generation, two or three removed from it. These nations we're dealing with have long histories that deeply infuse public policy making even to this day, which is, is different from ours, you know, in, in that sense. And in the case of, of, of Russia, they, they've never been Europe and they've never been Asia. And so they're kind of in the middle of these two worlds. They also have memories of both being a great empire. Uh, under the czar and then again under the Soviet Union. And in many ways, Putin is a product of both. And you've seen him try to sort of meld the two um, into sort of a czarist type role that he plays, but through elected office and at the same time sort of rebuild their global reach. So his interests uh, are to be viewed as an alternative to the United States on the global stage and, and to be a great power again. Now, he's not going to be a great economic power and he's not going to be a great conventional power but he can be a spoiler in enough places uh, that, that he becomes relevant. And that's why you've seen him engaged in place after place. So I just think whatever we do, it begins with that. And I think where Russia simply, I mean, we try to find places where there might be some, some common ground that we can work together on. And look, I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin. I think that uh, obviously he, he has, has done harm to this country and its interests around the world. But I think we have to deal with who people are and what they are as a reality and, and do the best we can for our country. And in that case, to, where there are possibilities to cooperate, be it against international terror, um, eventually, I believe, be it against Chinese uh, expansion. Um, you know, I, I think that for all of their cozy relationship today, there remains in the back of the Russian mind uh, the belief that they're now the junior partner and at some point China is going to try to exercise their long held claim that Siberia is theirs. Um, and so I, I don't think we should take that as something that we don't think about. So I think to the extent that there are places we can cooperate and work with them, we should. Um, but, uh, but I think we also need to recognize that their goal, that, that what helps Putin both internationally and domestically is to act as a spoiler to American interests. And no amount of being nice to him is going to change that and, 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 and approach it as such, whether it's, um, whether it's in the Middle East or the Western Hemisphere or other parts of, of, of the world. Okay. Um, it seems to me there's a, there's a sort of deep discussion going on in the Republican Party. In a way, you can say it's, you know, 30 years after the Reagan presidency, um, uh, where does the Republican Party go? That um, you've talked about common good capitalism as a kind of a, maybe a different twist on, on some elements of Republican Party ideas. And also earlier in our conversation, you talked about the need to rethink some American foreign policy ideas as part of a longer historical swing. How do you see the future of the Republican Party and, 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 what, and to what degree is the Republican Party moving away from the party that we knew for the last 30 years or, and to what degree is there continuity? Well, I think, first of all, we have no choice but to move away from the party we've been for 30 years on some issues because the world is not the same as it was 30 years ago on some issues. Uh, you can't use yesterday's answers to today's problems. In the case of common good capitalism, uh, it's a rejection of socialism. It's an embrace of capitalism, but it's also the fundamental argument that capitalism will always reach the most efficient outcome. And generally, that's very positive. 
but there are times when the most efficient outcome is not in the best interest of our country. It may be more efficient to source our active ingredients in pharmaceuticals, our rare earth minerals, to depend on China for personal protective equipment. That may be the most efficient place for it to happen. It's not in our national interest. It was also not in our national interest to deindustrialize the United States. And so the basic argument is we are a capitalist country, but in those instances in which the market outcome is not in the best interest of America, we need to remember that we don't, the market exists to serve the people, not the people to serve the market. And, and so that, that's the fundamental argument behind it. I would say that if you ask most people on the street, they would say, yeah, absolutely, that's exactly right. Um, on the case of foreign policy, I think we remain, uh, America's too powerful a country not to be involved in the world and our absence from the world stage would lead to calamity and chaos and friction and conflict that would eventually draw us in. That's the lesson from history. The other lesson from history is that even though we have tremendous power, we don't have unlimited power and that even though we be are more, in many ways more powerful than we've ever been from a relative point of view, we have less power in some cases because the world is a bigger place and there are other countries now with their own capabilities and the cost of engagement is high. So we have to constantly remember that, you know, um, from an, an outsider has the, um, someone who's not engaged in government, whether they're involved in academics or they're involved in the press or they're involved as a candidate, has the luxury of being an idealist across the board. Policymakers don't have the luxury of idealism. You have to deal with reality as it's presented to you and try to find the best outcome possible. And it's different in different parts of the world. There's no way we can pretend that our relation with China, for example, is, has to mirror and be consistent with our relationship with Cuba. And these are two very uh, diametrically opposed geopolitical challenges. And um, so I think it has to be the party that sort of talks about that. It's not an abandonment of our principles and ideals, but it is sort of doing the best we can to further them within the context of the pragmatic and, the, and, and of our national interests. As acting chair of the Select Committee on Intelligence, you have um, access to a lot of information that most of us don't. Um, without asking you to give anything away, as you think about America's situation in the world and, and what's out there, what worries you the most that you think maybe public opinion is not alert to or, or is, is not well informed about? What threats keep you up at night? Well, I think in the short term, it's um, the long-term impact of the global pandemic could actually threaten uh, uh, countries and governments and their stability. And um, even, uh, it's not just about the infection rate, it is the devastating impact it's had on, on the economies of multiple countries. It's what it will mean if there's a recovery or if the resources are available to some but not to others, nations where perhaps a vaccine or a cure may be available to people that are connected but not to those who aren't. So you worry about that sort of instability in the long term. I mean, this pandemic, uh, the tail on this thing is pretty long and, and its impact is going to be felt oh, for, for years to come in many developing countries. So you worry that that would lead to political disruption and the failure of nation states in multiple places. So um, I apologize, it was American. So I think that's one of the areas that we, um, that we, that, that I worry about in the short term. I think in the long term is the, the possibility of an, an anticipated crisis in the Asia Pacific region as an example. I, I think at some point in the near future, China is going to have to pick a war of choice, a place where uh, they put their, their military power to use to, to prove to prove it. You know, you can build all the ships and all the capabilities you want until you've used it. No one believes you have it. So I think they need to find somewhere where they're going to test it out. It has to be a place where they can, they can win quickly and de-escalate before uh, there's any sort of global mobilization against them. And and I worry about that because that could spiral very quickly if they pick the wrong place. For all of their growing military uh, power. Uh, the Chinese really haven't been involved in military conflict for a long time on a large and extended scale. So I you worry about the exuberance of sort of generals and, and military officials who, who feel pretty uh, confident about their abilities and want to put these toys to use. And, uh, and I think that's something to be really concerned about in, in, the, in the midterm. And I think obviously in the long term, it remains the, the issue of China and, and the fear that we may, if we don't take the appropriate steps now, wind up in 25 years or 20 years or even 15 years in a very different world, where we no longer have some of the uh, benefits of 
of the role we played today in all sorts of things, setting standards on all sorts of industries and how that benefits Americans, both from their security and their, and their economic standpoint. So you know, short term is the pandemic, midterm is some Chinese adventurism, and then long term is sort of a reordering of the global order to our detriment. All right. Conspicuously missing from uh, that list would be the Iranian nuclear program. What uh, there's been some speculation that Iran may be in a position by the end of this year to build a bomb, may have enough fissionable uh, material. How concerned are you about not only that possibility, but the reaction of other countries in the region to it? Yeah, and missing only because you know I tried to prioritize the thing that keeps you up at night the most. Yep. That that's an ongoing concern. And I think uh, the, the biggest concern about that, obviously, is um, we don't know what's, who's going to succeed the current Ayatollah, who, who clearly is uh, not going to be around for much longer, you know, I'm talking about not be another decade from now. We don't know what that transition looks like. We don't know if the direction that that clerical regime moves is, is more aggressive and more abrasive. Um, and, and frankly, um, th there is that concern that they develop this capability. From an Iranian standpoint, they don't even have to build the weapon. They just have to prove that they're nuclear capable and it buys them some level of immunity. But, but then there's the second facet of it, and that is elements within that government that actually believe that, that they could use such a weapon and, and, and win, use it uh, uh, successfully in, in some conflict, um, be it from a, a tactical weapon eventually or, or, a, or a strategic strike on, on Israel as an example. I also related to that is that there's no way there's going to be a Shia bomb and there not be a Sunni one. And so that some other countries in the region would quickly move to have their own capability. And suddenly you have multiple nuclear powers in the most uh, uh, conflictive uh, part of the world. So, so clearly that's a concern. And from the Iranian standpoint, ultimately the bottom line is that what all we can do is, is try to make the price of being a nuclear weapons power higher than the benefits. That, that's what we can try to do. And, and to do it in a way that's sustainable in the long term, which what the, the previous G JCPOA, the Iran deal, did not do, in my view. Um, and that continues to be our public policy, and I, I hope that will continue um, in, in a new Trump administration, a new, in a new Trump term. Do you think if, um, if Israel had the, uh, or we had the sort of near certainty that Iran was, was on the brink of some kind of, of bomb production, that there would be a military strike in response, or how worried are you well, about that? Well, I, I hate to speculate on it. Uh, obviously, that's the kind of thing that you know you don't want to be cavalier about. Uh, suffice it to say, though, that what has been missing here is that Iran continues to upgrade and improve its conventional capabilities, and it's done so. It's done so despite these sanctions. Imagine if they weren't in place, they would have even more revenue to advance that. So I, I do think as Iran continues to build both their conventional and asymmetric capabilities, in essence, their ability to make people pay a price for taking such action and continue to improve and harden their own domestic security, a, a military option that could successfully degrade their nuclear capability becomes less and less tenable. I would say that every year that goes by, it becomes harder to envision a military attack that, that could deny them the ability to have a weapons program. Um, it's not like they're going to put a neon light on the top of the place and say, here's where it is, come hit it. So, you know, that's a, that, that's a deep concern and, 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 uh, it's, and it'll be a factor uh, and it'll have to be weighed. I hope that moment never comes, but leaders will have to make that decision on the basis of, of those options that are available before them um, at that moment. So our best hope for peace is to do all we can to show the Iranian regime, that they are better off not having a weapon all across the board than from having one. And, and, um, and, and that's a, a huge challenge and, and a, a topic of real concern. All right. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. I just wonder before we finish, do you have any good news you'd like to share <laughs> with people? Because you've been talking most about very gloomy subjects. Yeah. Well, I mean, foreign policy is tough, right? I mean, it's, uh, it, as I said, it's, it's not, a, it's a tough place to, to sort of, uh, understand uh, that I, the idealism and the, the balance between idealism and pragmatism is very real. And, and uh, we have had to make throughout our history uh, pragmatic decisions that sometimes are difficult, but they're the right choice. And, 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 you know, you never, people, unfortunately, you know, history never talks about the crisis that was averted because, you know, it doesn't happen. And then people can always dispute over whether it did happen. And, um, and I think that's important to remember. 
um, when we talk about all of this is, is one of the big things about foreign policy is not something dealing with what before you now, but anticipating what it can turn into and trying to avoid that from happening and the willingness to do it, knowing you may never be rewarded for it, either politically or by history. So it's, uh, it's an, the world is changing. It's changing very fast. And, and our approach to it has to change to keep up. Um, I do think there are real opportunities in the world as well. I think by and large, the countries of the Western Hemisphere are democratic. I think by and large, uh, the world, uh, for the most part, has seen, has learned more about the, the, the growing global acceptance of, of what China's intentions are and push back against it. And we should be smart about mobilizing that in an effective way. Those are positive outcomes. And in the end, I always tell people this, um, you know, with all our challenges, and we have many, I still wouldn't trade places with any other country in the world. I wouldn't rather be another country. I wouldn't rather have another country's future. I'd still rather be us. And, um, and that certainly is something to remember every day before we take on all the bad and terrible and difficult things that we have to take on. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be speaking again as time goes on. And I know you've got some interesting work to do in the next couple of months. Uh, yeah. Big time. It's and been an interesting year much. all the way around. <laughs> yes. And not finished yet. The writers not keep adding yet. new plot twists. I know. I know. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Senator. Take care. Okay.